Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, a poet, scraps of clothes and a marionette. We'll discuss why Lucy Gluck won the Nobel Prize in Literature. Then, one designer's trash is this woman's treasure. And a giant puppet will walk 8,000 kilometers to tell stories of refugee children. In her career that spans more than five decades, Lucy Gluck's autobiographical poems have received a lot of love from the critics. She now has a Nobel Prize in Literature under her belt. American poet Louise Glick has won the 2020 Nobel Prize in Literature. The Nobel Prize in Literature for 2020 is awarded to the American poet Louise Glick for her unmistakable poetic voice that with austere beauty makes individual existence universal. The 77-year-old Yale professor is one of the most prominent poets in American contemporary literature. Her poetry is characterized by what the Academy called a striving for clarity, with a focus on childhood, family life and close relationships between parents and siblings. The Literature Prize has been dogged by controversy over the past several years. In 2019, the Academy exceptionally named two winners after postponing the 2018 prize in the wake of a sexual assault scandal involving the husband of one of its members. One of the literature laureates announced last year the Austrian novelist and playwright Peter Henke had drawn wild international criticism over his portrayal of Serbia as a victim during the 1990s Balkan Wars and attending the funeral of its nationalist strongman leader Slobodan Milosevic. Milosevic died in detention in 2016 while awaiting trial on genocide charges at the UN War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague. I'm now joined by poet and professor Fiona Sampson, who teaches at the University of Roehampton. Hi, Fiona. Thanks a lot for joining us on Showcase today. Hello. So, it's um, a pleasure to be here. I would say that um, she wasn't really widely known before uh, the Nobel Prize. I mean, not in, here in Turkey, for example. I don't think she has... Uh, a book that is actually not out of stock at the moment that people actually can read. And I don't really see her as one of the major North American poets. I mean, she wasn't famous in that sense. Do you think it was a good decision? Absolutely, the Nobel tradition. Because let's be honest, the Nobel, when it isn't being controversial and perhaps making mistakes, rewards a certain model of literature as having to do with humanity, having to do with kind of quite high stakes, literature which is more than entertainment. So I think it's a great choice. I don't think she's quite as unknown as maybe you're suggesting, mm -hmm. particularly in the English-speaking world. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I don't know how it is for you, but certainly here in Britain, almost every time someone wins the Nobel who is not a novelist, um, our literary journalists cry in alarm, but this is something we've never heard of. And um, usually as an eager reader myself, I have heard of them. So uh, it's very awkward, isn't it, for me to, to say this, but I think she is really quite well known, but I think she's probably not much of an internationalist mm -hmm. and she that well-known internationally. And I think that's a great problem, you know, in Anglophone cult and culture and its relationship to the world in general. Yes, thanks a lot. This, this is a really good point. Thanks a lot for bringing it up. I mean, obviously she's a poet and a lot of, I'm sure she's very well regarded in the literary world. All I was saying is that she's not a huge international literary star, like, I don't know, a lot of people who were up for, uh, you know, the Nobel Prize this year, but you're right. And she can definitely look forward to many new readers, and that's a, that's a great thing. But you said that she's very well known. I mean, she's well known in the Anglo-Saxon world. Which brings me to my next question, because the Nobel Prize is being criticized uh, very often for being very West-centric. And English is by far the most common language, which is understandable. But do you think that it is fair for the rest of the world? No, I think it is a huge problem. I spend my working life having anxiety and guilt about 
working in English. And particularly, I spend a lot of time on translation and actually publishing international writers alongside my own work. And I'm always embarrassed if I have to have conversation with with them in in English rather than for example you know French which is another language I speak I feel ashamed I feel there's a kind of gesture of cultural hegemony going on Mm -hmm. and I think that English language writers are very lazy and do tend to assume that English speaking world is all that they need to think about and I think that in any case in in global cultural terms the north is incredibly greedy and arrogant and doesn't think about enough about the whole world i one of the reasons I'm an admirer of, in principle, the Nobel Prize is that the Nobel has this remit to force us all to think of literature as a global community and to think not only about, for example, sales, which are always going to be higher in the affluent North and in a big language group, but to think about literature in its own merits and to get past local cultural politics also. So at its best, I think it works well. But I think it is slightly embarrassing, too. I suppose I am glad. I mean, I personally was really very disappointed when Bob Dylan got the Nobel Prize for Literature because I don't think that what he does is literature. I think it's something else. A very good thing, a nice thing, but something completely different. And I felt there was a kind of wasted opportunity for literature. And I think certainly in the Anglophone world, we probably thought, oh, well, we won't get a turn again now for 10 years. Yeah. Um, well, so I'm glad really they the case. Case. Okay. No, exactly. <laughs> yeah, Fiona, it's it's very lovely to delve deeper into these topics, but then we don't have much time left. So I want to understand. I mean, I think I'm being a little bit unfair here as well because I'm politicizing the whole Nobel Prize issue. And I don't think from what I read about Lucy Gluck, she's not that kind of a writer. Uh, and she really doesn't want to be in the public eye that much. So... Tell us, she's been awarded almost every prize a poet could ask for. What is, what is her X factor? What is the thing that she does the best in her poetry, you think? She thinks deeply about the human condition in a very personal way. And unlike most of our thinking about that collectively through the centuries, she does it as a woman. She doesn't only think that a woman's experience is our private lives, our romantic lives, our love lives, our children, and, you know, the domestic. She thinks about the big existential questions, faith, life, death, um, meaning, philosophy, culture, through the figure of a woman. And that's incredibly important for the half of the world who are women, that we ask and answer, or we can't answer, we try and answer these big questions through our own experiences and, and, and f- the figure of a woman too. But she also does it with just stunning um, acuity and delicacy, but great strength. So she will be very um, almost hostile um, when writing about siblings sometimes. But then she also writes great poems of bereavement and loss. She writes with great um, ease. She brings whatever's cultural and historical Mm -hmm. into her poems, but she doesn't label it. It's all incorporated into what you might call a line of beauty. Lovely. Well, uh, let's note that she is the first woman since 1996 uh, to win the prize. So that's lovely. That's a lovely way of thinking about this as well. It was lovely having you on our show today, but unfortunately, this is all the time we have. Thanks a lot for joining us. A pop art exhibition in Madrid shows the movement's experimental reflections on 60 years of American culture and politics. Nur Sena has more. Madrid's Caixa Forum Cultural Center presents El Sueño Americano, the American Dream. This exhibition is about the journey of the North American print art starting from the 1960s. The titans of pop art such as Andy Warhol and Roy Lichtenstein are among the 64 artists on display. So it was a period of great um, creativity in printmaking and we wanted to show um, 
the audience that prints aren't just copies of paintings or drawings. Prints are original works of art in their own right. Um, and they, because of the way in which they're made, they can then be um, produced in limited editions, which allows artists to get their work out to a wider audience and allows more people to engage with, with art. Pop art uses popular culture as its main source of inspiration. During the 60s, the emergence of the middle classes and the rise of advertising made the prints of the time very colourful and eye-catchy. The movement showed the postmodern art was accessible to masses, not only a selected few. The subjects were often political too. You can see civil rights and feminist movements, the Cold War and the Vietnam War depicted. Adapting to the quickly changing trends of the time, the forms and techniques varied as well. What also changed was diversity in the art world. I think it's clear from the exhibition that in the 1960s, the art world was still a very male dominated place and it was very um, dominated by white male artists. And I think we can see in this exhibition that over the years, um, the mainstream art world in America has become more diverse. The curator, Catherine Daunt, says the exhibition is an opportunity to see how the artists of the time viewed, criticised and sometimes reflected on the society in which they lived. And since the exhibition covers 60 years of art, the organisers think the exhibition acts like a timetable of those changing years in the United States. A refugee girl's giant puppet will march from the Turkey-Syria border to the Manchester International Festival. The journey is expected to go from April to July. The walk aims to raise awareness on the suffering of kids. And this particular story is about little Amal. She takes the 8,000 kilometer journey in the hopes of finding her mother. Media outlets call the event one of the most ambitious public artworks ever attempted. Let's talk to David Len, who co-produced the project. Hi, David. It's a pleasure uh, having you on Showcase today. So, I mean... It's very good to be with you. Thank you. Obviously, the Syrian issue is a huge one. But then uh, the attention of the world is elsewhere right now. So I wonder why you thought it was a good time to do this project. Exactly for that reason. Because the attention of the world is elsewhere at the moment. Um, our feeling about it is that there are many really critical problems facing the world. Uh, we all know what they are. Um, but the issue of the well-being of refugees, and especially uh, young refugees, children, um, has to stay as close as we can get it to uh, the top of our minds. So this seemed to us an essential time uh, to do this project. Okay, but why a, a puppet of a nine-year-old girl? I mean, why are you focusing on Syrian children in particular? Well, where the idea came from is about three years ago, I produced a play which was about the refugee camp in northern France, in Calais. It was a play called The Jungle. And one of the characters in that play was a nine-year-old little Syrian girl, a refugee, uh, from Aleppo. There were many other characters in the play from Syria, from Iraq, from Iran, from Eritrea, from Sudan, many other places as well. But this little child was very important to us in the play, even though she didn't say very much, as a, as a presence, as an expression of the vulnerability of people who have been forced to leave their homes. Nobody wishes to leave their home, but have been forced to leave their home because of the war and the danger um, that, that, um, that they were subject to. And after we'd done that play in two theatres in London and then in New York and then in San Francisco, we still remained very moved by stories that people had told us of their journeys across Turkey and across Europe. Um, but especially we thought of the children because of our experience of 
uh, creating this character, little, little um, Amal, in the play. So we had the idea of recreating the journey that she had made, our imaginary little Amal, representing all the young people, um, boys as well as girls, uh, who've been forced into the situation. Yeah. But we wanted it to be theatre. We're, we're artists, we're theatre people, we wanted it to be theatre. And so we had the idea of representing the little girl as a, as a puppet. Okay, so you said that it was good timing to remind people of the Syrian issue right now because, uh, you know, our attention is elsewhere. So I reckon that you are actually trying to send a message with this project. What is it? Well, it's the message of little Amal. It's the message of the, of, of the child. And it's, it's really simple. The message is just don't forget about us. It's a humanitarian message. Okay. It's don't forget about us. So would you say That's that it's a message of hope, for example? Well, as, as many of your listeners will know, um, Amal means hope in Arabic. Um, it means hope. And um, she brings with her hope. Uh, when we first imagined the, the, the puppet, we imagined it as being a vulnerable child. But actually, as you can see from the photographs or from the moving images, She's a very powerful puppet. She's a young woman who has something to tell us. She has experience. Um, she has a message for us. Um, she needs our help. She's a child. And as, as you know, we're inviting all the way along the route, we're inviting artists and arts organizations and humanitarian organizations and local governments and so on to welcome her in whatever okay. way is appropriate to them. Okay, but David. she has authority. Mm. She has power. Okay, you say that she has authority and power. Is it important for you, uh, the kind of message that this is sending to Syrian audiences of uh, this project? I mean, do you think that they would be empowered by uh, encountering this project? Well, I hope they will understand that there are many people in Europe who are concerned with the well-being of people who have suffered because of the war over many years now. And I suppose if you understand that there are people who are thinking about you and are working in various ways uh, for your well-being, um, that can make people feel more, uh, can, can make people feel stronger about um, living in the very difficult circumstances that they may be in. Mm -hmm. And um, before we wrap up, do you have any Syrians on your team? Um, uh, yes, we have many Syrian artists, uh, people who are living across uh, Turkey, across Europe, mm -hmm. who are working with us. Uh, a large number of the artists that we're working with are from Syria. And um, you have an international team, very international team, I think, as well. That's correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that's right. That, that, yeah. Okay, so um, one last question before we wrap up. So a lot of projects regarding the Syrian war uh, have come out in the past, I don't know, decade. So um, do you believe in the power of art to actually change things when it is the weapons that is, you know, making the dialogue on uh, Syrian territory? If I could stop the weapons, I would stop the weapons. I have no power to stop the weapons. What we can do is remind each other of our common humanity. That is what art can do. Art can say to us, remember your common humanity and forget everything else. Mm -hmm. All right. Good luck with that, David. It was lovely talking to you. Thanks a lot. A Filipina who wants to become a country music singer. This might not sound like the right setting for a story about immigration, but Critics argue that Yellow Rose does just that with flying colors. And they also say that director Diane Paragos brings a whole new perspective to immigration representation on screen. Never fit in, never could win. This isn't the likely one. Yellow Rose tells the tale of Rose Garcia. She's an undocumented immigrant and an aspiring country singer and she has to look for a new home when immigration officers apprehend her mother. On her journey, 
she finds an unlikely mentor, country musician Jimmy Redbird. The movie is inspired by the life story of its director, Diane Paragos, and it took her 15 years to get the project off the ground. But reviews say the film came out just at the right time. I don't even have a name anymore. I'm 35. Do you want to hear a song? Yeah. Yeah? Promise you won't laugh at me? Oh, yeah. Pinky promise? U.S. Yeah. immigration policies have faced fierce criticism for separating children from their parents. I'll never fit in. The film is now being celebrated as both relevant and biting social commentary. Though I tried and tried, this feeling don't end. Yellow Rose is also receiving attention for its fresh approach to portraying race relations on screen. Its lead pairing is unconventional to say the least. An immigrant girl and the American cowboy who takes her under her wing. Normally, in any other movie, these two archetypes would be opposing each other. Critically, Lay points out that Yellow Rose finds parallels between these opposing groups. But they can't take freedom away. Through the exploration of such themes as common interests, like music, and the importance of freedom, the movie shows how different people actually share a lot in common. We've covered artists from all over the world reusing various scrap materials, even garbage. This next story is about an artist who upcycles wasted fabric into woven paintings. She sells them for thousands of dollars and has participated in prominent art fairs this year, including Art Dubai and the LA Art Show. Take a look. When a local fashion house is discarding fabric, Marcelina Akpojotor is there to collect it for her next creation. Sometimes these tailors are likely to just burn them or throw them into the running waters. But because I go there and they have someone who collects them, so they are also keeping it and the environment is safe. Instead of throwing them away, I'm repurposing them. Born in Lagos, Akpojotor had her first apprenticeship under her father. She used to assist him with drawing, design, stencil, writing and calligraphy work before she eventually moved on to study art and industrial design. She blends collages with traditional painting and makes portraits using a local fabric called Ankara, also known as the African print fabric. Art materials requests are quite expensive. If, if you don't have some money, you, you can't get some certain materials. But this fabric was just lying around, so I started using them to create um, jewelries. From there, I was also doing drawing. From there, I just questioned myself that I could push what I was doing further. So I started using the Ankara to make um, faces. She says the Ankara fabric represents the diverse emotions of women. She explores femininity, personal and societal identity, and issues surrounding female empowerment in contemporary society. The fabric makes my work unique because it's an, um, it's an identifier. When you see it, it pulls you in. You have a com there's a common ground between you and the work because it's fabric. It's something that you know you're familiar with. Akpojotor's work has sold for as much as $25,000. The Rela Gallery, which represents Akpojotor, found her on social media and featured her first solo exhibition in 2018. At first, when you look at it, you don't see that it's discarded fabrics. But as soon as you come closer, you see that it's different colors, shapes from different types of discarded fabric that she's using. So that's one thing that stands out for them also. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing how somebody can take waste 
and create a mix and make something out of it. Akpojo Tor has pieced together and sold more than a hundred works for the gallery, and she hopes that success will catapult her into other artistic mediums in the future. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Ilfere Ketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.